today, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about turbine oils. Specifically, we want to talk about the difference between aeroderivative turbines and their standard industrial cousins. We're going to talk about the unique requirements that jet engines have and therefore how that drives differences in the formulation because jet oils and standard gas turbine oils are very different from each other. Let's get into it. So let's talk about the unique requirements of a jet oil. And in the power generation world, one that you will have seen a lot of is the LM6000. This is an aeroderivative turbine that's built by GE. And if we compare it with, let's say, the Frame 9, which is also built by GE, how could we describe the differences? Well, if I took an analogy from the automotive world, I would describe the Frame 9 as being like a really high performance sports car that's available on the consumer market. Something like the Mercedes AMG GTS, right? A really good car, very expensive, by the way. Um, you know, in Australia, you're looking at close to 500 grand. Very high performance, but is also built to be extremely reliable. Some people, very rich people, might even use this as a daily driver. So they need to drive their kids to and from school. They need to make sure that it doesn't break down, even though it can provide those extremely high levels of performance. So that's what you're getting out of that package. Now, I'm particularly partial to this car. I think it looks great on the road. I think it sounds great on the road. I think it's got a lot of personality. I would describe this car as being like, it's chef's kiss, right? It's, it's just, it's that sweet spot of sports car, which is just highly refined, but super aggressive at the same time. Now, I would describe the LM6000 as being something closer to the Mercedes Formula One car. It's everything that's in the AMG GTS, but taken to the extreme. It revs faster, the engine runs at higher temperatures, it puts out more power, it's more efficient. It takes everything that is in Mercedes road car technology and it takes it to the extreme. And you'll see that in the differences in the engine oil formulations, right? Um, the engine oil formulations that they use in Formula One are basically experimental. They use all kinds of new additives that are really on the frontier and have never made their way into the consumer market before. Now, I do plan on doing uh, a video on that, so stay tuned for that. But I would describe the Formula One car as being double chef's kiss, right? It's, it's, that, it's just amazing, right, the technology that goes into this stuff. So now let's talk about some of the unique um, or, or different operating circumstances that you would see in a jet engine versus a standard industrial gas turbine. And the first one is higher operating temperatures. Right? These things just run way hotter than their industrial cousins. And that drives the biggest difference in the formulations, which is that the jet oils are all synthetic esters. Specifically, the type 2 and type 3 oils are all polyol esters. That requirement is driven by the higher operating temperatures. So in the industrial gas turbine world, you'll typically see, well, it used to be group 1 turbine oils. Now it's more likely going to be a group two with a dash of group three. In very, very rare circumstances, I've seen uh, PAO turbine oils, but that's exceedingly rare. Most of the time you're looking at a, a mineral oil. However, because the aeroderivative engines run at such high temperatures, a mineral oil is just not going to cut it. And so that's why we have entered the realm of polyol esters. Now you might ask, why are we operating at such high temperatures? Well, ultimately, it's a drive for greater efficiency. So that's one of the ways that the uh, jet turbine uh, manufacturers have been able to extract more efficiency is to run at higher temperatures. However, um, that comes with a few trade-offs, right? It means that you need to use better quality oil. Now, why are we chasing greater efficiency all the time? Well, you've got to remember the airlines, they live and die by fuel economy, right? Their fuel burn contributes a massive part of their expenditure. So anything that they can do to reduce their jet fuel usage is going to add to their profitability. So that's why it's such a huge driver for the aviation market. Now, one of the other things is that aircraft have to operate at a much, operate at a much wider ambient temperature range as well. Now, I mean that in two ways. One of the ways is just the weather, right? So, um, you know, aircraft have to operate in the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia, they have to still take off and land, or they could be 
in the middle of a winter in, let's say, in Alberta, Canada. I'm just trying to pick a cold place. Obviously, being from Australia, I'm not much of an expert on cold places. So that's one way in which the ambient temperature is much colder. However, you've also got to think that when they're flying at 30,000 feet, it is very, very cold up there. Now, this isn't as much of an issue for the main engines, but for the APU, which is the small engine that's in the tail, that's generally shut down for most of the flight, and it needs to start up while they're at 30,000 feet. Now, they tend to use a, a, a lower viscosity oil for that one. It's a, it's a three stoke instead of a five stoke, but still, it gives you an idea for the fact that they have to operate in a much wider ambient temperature range. One of the other things that's a little bit unique about the aeroderivative engines is that they run at higher speeds. Now, I obviously don't mean like ground speed. They're obviously flying through the air much faster than their industrial cousins, which are fixed to the ground. But I mean the rotational speed, right? It, they gen tend to operate at higher RPM. And the other one is a much smaller oil reservoir. So if you think about an industrial gas turbine, generally you, well, you might be mounted on a skid or it's bolted to the floor. You're not really that space constrained, right? You might be a little bit because you're trying to jam in other equipment around the package, but you can afford a couple of thousand liters in your oil reservoir. Aircraft can't afford that weight. So typically, I mean, you might even see a, a 20 gallon sump. That's that's tiny, that's like 100 liters, right? So a, a tiny, tiny oil reservoirs mean that you don't have um, a large volume of oil to, um, to, to manage the, the thermal and oxidative instability of the oil. Now remember, you know, if you if you try to add more weight, that's obviously pretty bad for for aircraft. So that's why uh, they have to operate with with much smaller oil reservoirs. Some other things to think about as well, um, which drive changes in the formulation, are regulations around what comes out of the back of the engine. So a lot of um, regulations are around there not being a lot of soot that comes out the back of the engines. And so that actually drives the aeroderivative formulations to be completely metal free. So they have to be a completely ashless anti-wear package. That's very, very different from the standard gas turbines oil, which might contain things like ZDDP. Finally, and this is one of the really big uh, regulatory burdens on the jet oils, is... Uh, well, let's let's tell a story. Let's say that this is John, and John is responsible for filling the engines on this aircraft with uh, with turbine oil. And let's say that the standard turbine oil that he always uses is Mobilejet uh, three eight seven. Right? Uh, he fills it up, but one day, for some reason, he fills it with Eastman turbo turbo oil two three or twenty three eight. Right? He just makes a mistake. Oh, John, you idiot! Um, now he better hope that when that aircraft goes up uh, to 30,000 feet, that that engine does not have a massive accident, right? Because we can't afford accidents in the aviation industry. Now, the regulators were able to foresee this a long, long time ago, and they sort of made the rule that all jet oils have to be completely miscible. They have to be completely compatible with each other. And so that's one of the big differences, which gives us confidence Right, is that if uh, any uh, aircraft mechanic accidentally mixes two different jet oils, we're going to be fine. Right, so that's one of the big differences in, in among the jet all the jet oils is that they are all completely compatible with each other. You don't see that in the industrial gas turbine market where some of the oils may not be compatible because um, even though they might all be mineral oils, the uh, for example the um, the anti wear packs might not play well with each other. So that's another one of the big differences. All right, so hopefully by illustrating some of the unique challenges of the aviation industry, we've given a bit of a window into why it is that the lubricating oils for aeroderivative turbines are so different from their gas turbine cousins. As usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.